Well, good afternoon. Let me say that it is indeed a great privilege and an honor um, for me to be here. Uh, I have, uh, like, like many of you, like most of you, perhaps even all of you, uh, I have been blessed over the years and enriched over the years by the preaching and teaching that has come from this pulpit, and uh, I'm grateful. I'm, I'm, I'm always humbled when I'm here because Dr. MacArthur started pastoring this church the year I was born. Um, and, and uh, you know, I, I, was, I was born here in Los Angeles, and so I, I always feel like there's this, you know, this unique bond between us, at least from my end, you know. <laughs> um, so I'm always grateful um, to be here. I'm grateful for ICR. Um, I'm grateful for the invitation to be a part of this. Uh, grateful to have the opportunity to join uh, my fellow speakers. Has this not been incredible over the last couple of days? grateful for men who stand, you know, with just an unabashed commitment to the Word of God, um, to biblical understanding of origins, who do so with winsome, intelligent, and articulate arguments, um, to do it in such a way um, that they can enrich us and deepen our understanding of these issues. Uh, my assignment today was to address the importance of Genesis uh, and the issue of education and um, I, I decided that it was really difficult to, to, to do that, and so I added another layer to it to make it even more difficult to do it in the time that was allotted. Um, today, I'm going to address what I believe is the most pressing cultural issue that we face today, and that is the issue of same-sex marriage. And it's an issue that has its roots in our understanding of origins, and it is an issue that has its roots in modern American education. I want to help you understand why that's so and how that is so. So I want to do a few things here. Um, one is I want to help you understand how this is a Genesis issue and uh, a Genesis 1, 2, and 3 issue. And then secondly, I want to help you understand how it is that this issue has been framed by those who um, are promoting this lifestyle. Thirdly, I want you to understand how that framing has actually affected us as believers. Fourthly, I want you to understand how the education system has been used and co-opted in order to advance this ideology. And then finally, if we have time, I want to equip you with an apologetic response. Um, I, I'm going to say what Dr. MacArthur said on last night. I don't see how we get through all of this, but let's get started and see where we end up. Amen? All right, let's get started. This was a, a, a cover article in The Advocate from a few years ago, Gay is the New Black. And that's the line of argumentation that has been most successful for same-sex marriage advocates this line of argumentation that sees this issue as the, the latest issue in the civil rights struggle. Um, well, I'm here today to tell you that it's not like being black. Not in any way, shape, form, or fashion. And this is not a civil rights issue. Let's look first at what Genesis teaches about marriage. We'll just look at, at two verses in Genesis 2. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. They shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Notice the categories here. We have man. We have father, mother. We have man, wife, man, or wife, man, wife. It is clear here in Genesis chapter 2 that marriage is to be understood as a relationship between the two corresponding halves of humanity, between men and women. It is clear 
that marriage is not only to be understood as a relationship between the two corresponding halves of humanity, but marriage is also to be understood within the context of families that procreate or that have the potential for procreation or that categorically allow for procreation. Also, if we look at this other one flesh, these two become one flesh. This idea of a one flesh union is about the corresponding complementary makeup of men and women. It is clear from a biological perspective how men and women are to unite in a one flesh union and how that one flesh union bears fruit, which is further evidence. So if you just, if you know nothing, if you know nothing about the way that human beings are supposed to be mated with one another, you just look at them and you get a pretty good clue. <laughs> then, several months later, you get a bonus clue that says, yep, that was how it was supposed to happen. <laughs> and so we know this. We know this from Genesis. This is, this is very important. It's also one of these issues where we, we, we run up against our brothers and sisters with whom we disagree on the importance of reading Genesis the way that we read Genesis. Those who say that it's really not all that important, it really doesn't matter that much, uh, answering questions about origins, answering questions about whether it's six literal days or whether we have a literal Adam and Eve, so on and so forth, that's really not all that important. What matters is the cross. Okay, who died on the cross? Jesus. Um, what did Jesus say about this? Matthew 19, three through six, the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let, my, let, let not man separate. So Jesus' teaching on divorce is rooted in his understanding of Genesis. His understanding of Genesis is rooted in a literal reading of Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. So when we are to understand not just sin and redemption and the cross, but when we are to understand marriage, where marriage comes from, what marriage is for, Jesus himself argues hermeneutically that we can only understand marriage properly when we understand Genesis properly. And when we understand Genesis properly, we read Genesis literally, in its normal sense. These were two literal people. These were not just two representatives. These were two literal people. They were the two first people who were created. And it is from these two individuals that we get our understanding of what marriage is. We also understand the purpose of marriage from Genesis. Even in Genesis, we understand that marriage has the purpose of procreation, excuse me, the purpose of procreation, illustration, and sanctification. We get this even in Genesis. We understand that there is a procreative purpose. This be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Adam's not going to do that by himself. He needs Eve for that. We understand the idea of illustration. This is a picture. This is a picture of the triune God who has existed for eternity in union and unison with himself in the Godhead. God the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit in perfect unity and perfect harmony. The Son eternally proceeding from the Father, or, or eternally begotten of the Father, and the Spirit eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son makes man in his image, and woman proceeds from the side of man, and from their union proceeds children. We understand that this is an illustration. It's a picture of who God is. We also understand this idea of sanctification, that there is a holiness in marriage, that the man and woman are naked and they're not ashamed. Sin enters into the world and the man and the woman are ashamed of their nakedness. One of the funniest things in the whole Bible, that, that, I mean, Genesis 3, I just can't read it without just busting my side. First, you know, God shows up and Adam runs and hides behind a tree. Can he see me? 
And then second, you know, where were you? Oh, I, you, you okay, okay, see, well, all right, wait, okay, see, so, okay, okay, see, so what had happened was, you, okay, you came, and then, and I was, and then I hid, because I was, because I was, because I was naked. And then the greatest question probably in the whole Bible, who told you you were naked? Because you've been naked the whole time, bro. I mean, you know, you know. You ate from the tree, didn't you? You ate from the tree. Sin enters and guilt and shame enters. And so this violation of this one flesh union comes because of sin. So we understand, even from Genesis, the purpose of marriage. So what's wrong with homosexuality? Um, a number of things, but just a few in this context. Number one, it's a violation of the created order. It's a violation of the created order. It's not how we were made. Secondly, it denounces procreation categorically. It denounces procreation categorically. And I say categorically because, you know, the homosexual lobby, they try to be slick. Or are you saying that people who are beyond childbearing years shouldn't get married? No, because categorically, they are still the two corresponding parts of humanity that produce children and produce a family that is designed to raise, rear, and protect children. So categorically, they're still in the same ballpark even if they don't have children. Thirdly, it blasphemes the illustration. It blasphemes the illustration. This is especially true when we understand the illustration of Christ and His bride, the church. And then finally, it denies the very need for sanctification because it takes what God calls sinful and calls it righteous. God calls this an abomination, and we instead call it righteous. It's the only sin, by the way, for which God destroyed cities with fire and brimstone. It's unique. It's unique. It's not like other sins. It's unique. Not all sins are called abominations. Homosexuality is unique in that regard. Very few sins in that category. And not all sins were the ended in God destroying twin cities with fire and brimstone. It's unique in that regard. Not all sins are talked about in the Bible, like in Romans 1, as having a penalty in the flesh. Homosexuality is. It's unique in that regard. Okay? What about this issue of education? So, again, we, we, we understand there, and we'll talk about this more, that our understanding of Genesis is crucial to our understanding of marriage, and it's crucial to our understanding of homosexuality and its, and its inappropriateness. But what about this issue of education? How do we make this connection? Let me just give you, let me just give you one example. Um, Arnie Duncan is the uh, Secretary of Education for the United States. Um, and uh, lest you think that Arnie Duncan was, was brought up to be the Secretary of Education because of his skills as an ed education secretary, um, when he was the Secretary of Education in Illinois before he came to Washington, D.C., um, only 83% of eighth graders couldn't read at grade level. And, and only 87% of eighth graders couldn't do math at grade level. And only 77% of eighth graders couldn't write at grade level, and only 84% of eighth graders couldn't do science at grade level. That's all. <laughs> he was horrible. But he was innovative. By the way, here's what's more astonishing. Um, he did this by spending a modest $10,555 per year per student. Now, we homeschool our children. So I just sort of extra extrapolated that. And we got four who are schooling right now. And so, you know, that would be like us spending $42,220 on the education of the four children that we're educating at home right now. Give me that. <laughs> I'll do better than he did in Chicago, I guarantee you, all right? And everybody's always hollering, it's a money issue. No, it's not. No, it's not. That's a perverse amount of money to spend on education. Perverse. 
doesn't cost that much. By the way, home educators outperform public and private schoolers and spend an average of less than $600 per student per year. Money is not the answer. Money is not the answer. So what was this all about? Well, he started Chicago's Annenberg Challenge, which was one of the innovative Marxist programs um, that was established there in Chicago. Uh, by the way, Bill Ayers and Barack Obama served together on the board of the Annenberg Challenge. Um, he endorsed establishing the Chicago Social Justice High School's Pride Campus. What's significant about that? Um, it was Chicago's first government high school for the promotion and reinforcement of the sodomite lifestyle. It was a gay campus. It was a gay campus. Then there's a guy, Kevin Jennings. Who's Kevin Jennings? Well, he's a founder of GLSEN, the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network. Um, his goal through GLSEN was to have a gay straight alliance in every school in America. Um, I, virtually every school district in America uh, has gay straight alliances in them. But then he developed another brilliant strategy. His strategy was to introduce a program called Safe Schools. It's an anti-bullying curriculum, or at least that's what it goes by. It's actually a pro-homosexual curriculum designed to indoctrinate school children toward the homosexual lifestyle. Um, what does this have to do with Secretary Duncan? Um, Secretary Duncan brought Kevin Jennings to Washington to be the safe schools czar, to federalize his pro-homosexual curriculum for all school districts in these United States of America. This is earware. Not everywhere, earware. That's beyond everywhere, okay? <laughs> it's earware, y'all. There is no escaping. But here's the question, why blackness? Why attach this to blackness? Why try to make the civil rights argument uh, I mentioned that article in The Advocate. The Advocate is a, a pro-homosexual magazine. I would recommend that you not go get a copy um, <laughs> just because, just, you just, I would recommend you not do that to yourself. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's vile. Uh, but listen to uh, what the arc author, uh, Michael uh, Denini, wrote. We have no natural allies and therefore cannot rely on the assistance of any group. We have only tactical allies people who do not want barbarous things done to us because they fear the same things may someday be done to them. It's the only thing that they can rely on, he says. All we've got to rely on is to have people think that they need to protect us so that they are not next. Russell Kirk and Hunter Madsen, we'll talk about them more later, but listen to this. To suggest in public that homosexuality might be chosen is to open the can of worms labeled moral choice and sin and give the religious intransigence a stick to beat us with. Straights must be taught, excuse me, straights must be taught that it is as natural for some persons to be homosexual as it is for others to be heterosexual. Wickedness and seduction have nothing to do with it. And since no choice is involved, gayness can be no more blameworthy than straightness. I want you to notice that this is an argument from origins. This is an argument based upon their understanding of the nature of man. This is why Genesis matters. They're arguing that this is the way we were made or this is the way that we have evolved, and therefore, there is no morality associated with it. Now, this is a dangerous statement to make. I, I mean, suppose, you know, we can, we can say that I have a genetic pre predisposition toward violence. Does that make it okay? Because we can prove that I have a genetic predisposition? If I have a genetic predisposition toward drunkenness, does that make it okay? Officer pulls me over. Sir, you been drinking? Officer, I don't even know. <laughs> Sir, you want to get out of the car? Okay, but before I do, you should need to know, I got that drunk gene. <laughs> oh, well, sir, I'm sorry. Please, weave on your way.
In fact, it is as simple as a matter of the odds, one in 10 as to who turns out gay and who's straight. Each heterosexual must be led to realize that he might easily, as easily have been born homosexual himself. Uh, by the way, the one in 10 number uh, in their book, they acknowledge that there's nothing to support this number um, other than debunked Kinsey research. And, and we know, we know and they know that Kinsey's research um, is not reliable. The most widely accepted study on sexual practice in the United States um, is the National Health and Social Life Survey. Um, and according to that research, 2.8% uh, of males and 1.4% of females identify themselves as gay, lesbian, or bisexual. So somewhere between one and 3%, not 10%, somewhere between one and 3%. Um, who are the key exponents of this gay equals black ideology? Several people. One, obviously homosexual activists. Secondly, uh, black civil rights leaders. And they have to be black civil rights leaders because the homosexual community knew that they had to have black people as cover because membership has its privileges. There's certain things that I can say that you can't. I mean, I don't write the rules, okay? I'm just saying. In fact, that's one of the reasons that people don't want people who look like me talking about this issue. Because other people, they just say, well, you're just a, you're just a bigot. You're just a racist bigot. And with me, they just go, well, you just... I do not like the race card, but if you got one, you know, um, judges, judges are joining the fray. Business and political leaders and even religious leaders who are very important in this process. Uh, let's look at these and some we'll pay a little more attention to for the sake of time. Um, there's a book, um, After the Ball, the subtitle is How America Will Overcome Its Fear and Hatred of Gays in the Decade of the 90s. Two Harvard professors. Russell Kirk and Hunter Matson. I've already quoted them earlier. One was a professor uh, in the area of uh, psychology and the other in marketing. And they wrote this book in 1989. In 1988, there was a meeting of 104 leading homosexual activists. And they strategized uh, as to how they could change the way people viewed homosexuals and homosexuality. In 1989, this book was published. Um, and it, it, if you read it today, it reads like history. You, 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 you can't believe that it was actually published in 1989. Um, the moment, listen to what they say. This is them in the book. All of this is, this is them. AIDS, though a loose cannon, is a cannon indeed. As cynical as it may seem, AIDS gives us a chance, however brief, to establish ourselves as a victimized minority, legitimately deserving of America's special protection and care. This, therefore, is the question and the challenge. How can we surmount our insurmountable opportunity? How can we maximize the sympathy and minimize the fear? How, given the horrible hand that AIDS has dealt us, can we best play it? How do we take advantage of the AIDS crisis? Never, never let a crisis go to waste. The method. The campaign we outline in After the Ball, though complex, depends centrally upon a program of unabashed propaganda, firmly grounded in long-established principles of psychology and advertising, the two fields of these Harvard professors who wrote the book. Um, propaganda. By the way, this is what they say about propaganda. The characteristics, the three characteristics distinguish propaganda from other modes of communication and continue or, or contribute to its sinister reputation. Again, these are the authors writing. Their program is a program of propaganda. And now they're telling you why propaganda has such a bad reputation. Um, just a few things. One, it relies on emotional manipulation. Two, it uses lies, like one in 10. And three, it's subjective and one-sided. 
This is their strategy. In emotional manipulation, lies, and subjective, one-sided information. Tell our side of the story as movingly as possible. In the battle for hearts and minds, effective propaganda knows enough to put its best foot forward. This is what our own media campaign must do. And in 89, they outlined a media campaign. What do they want to do in their media campaign? Three things. Desensitizing, jamming, and conversion. Um, by the way, these are the three steps to brainwashing. Um, these, are, these are the three things that they wanted to do. The, this is the way that they wanted people to change the way they thought. This is the way they wanted to get people like us off of a Genesis-oriented understanding of origins and their consequences to another understanding of origins and their consequences. Desensitizing, what does that look like? Um, to desensitize straights to gays and gayness, inundate them in a continuous flood of gay-related advertising presented in the least offensive fashion possible. If straights can't shut off the shower, they may at least eventually get used to being wet. Desensitizing, tell the truth. You see a gay character on a show, you don't even get offended anymore. It's just there. We're just so used to it. How? Movies, TV shows, commercials, outed actors and athletes. These are the ways that you desensitize, get people used to it. By the way, in the movies, the homosexual character has to be the best dressed, most intelligent, wittiest, and funniest character in the movie and in the television shows. They have to be that. Now, when you get popular people like actors who come out, that's okay. But when you get an athlete to come out, this is even more important. This is why when you get an NBA basketball player to come out, the President of the United States congratulates him. This is why when Michael Sam comes out before the NFL draft, it is national news everywhere you can think of. Why? Because these are the images that must be put forward for this particular propaganda campaign. And please notice that the White House spoke out in both of those instances and in support of both of those instances. Why is that important? The athlete angle is really important because of jamming. Desensitizing doesn't matter. We just want you to be exposed. Jamming requires a particular kind of exposure. Accuse religious people. Gays can use talk to muddy the moral waters. That is, to undercut the rational, rationalizations that justify religious bigotry and to jam some of its psychic rewards. Portray anti-gay institutions as antiquated and backwards and badly out of step with the times and with the latest findings of psychology. Another thing you do as far as jamming, you want to understand what jamming is. Jamming works when you take two contradictory images and juxtapose them. And so Christian people hate the idea of the Nazis and the skinheads and the KKK. So what you do is you portray people who are against same-sex marriage as being akin to Nazis, skinheads, and the KKK. Since nobody wants to be accused of being a Nazi, a skinhead, or the KKK, eventually nobody's going to want to be accused of being anti-same-sex marriage. This is jamming. This is why in your average Sunday sermon from a pastor that deals with homosexuality, the first third of it will be apologizing. Imagine this on a Sunday morning from a church. Now, church, we're going to address the issue of adultery, but I don't want you to be alarmed. I am not here to bash adulterers. I love adulterers. Jesus loves adulterers. I have friends who are adulterers. And I believe that our church needs to be open and accepting toward adulterers. And I want you to be, right? That just feels wrong, doesn't it? But every time a pastor goes to preach on homosexuality, we expect that to be up front. Why? Because we've been jammed. That's why. We've been jammed. It has been successful. That's why the most onerous sin that you can imagine from a scriptural perspective has us apologizing for saying what God says about it. 
And so out of step with psychology, what? Psychology proves this stuff? Yeah, because everybody knows that that's how people are born, right? We have the LeVay brain study, you know, uh, Bailey, Bailey and Pillard's twin study. Um, we have Hamer's X chromosome study. Um, you know, we've got uh, Savick's pheromone study. Uh, so, of course, I mean, all of these things, by the way, none of these things, none of these things, none of these things has proven a genetic connection to homosexuality. And even if it did, it wouldn't matter. Do, do you realize that there is nothing that proves that people are homosexual? How do you know? How do you know a person is homosexual? The only way you know is if they tell you. But there's no way to prove it. There's not even any way to prove that that category of people actually exists as a category, other than just a behavior. There's no way to prove it. How do you prove it? Is there a blood test? How do you prove it? You can't. You can't. But everybody assumes that it just is. And we assume, and we don't even question people when they say, well, you know, as young as I can remember, when I was a little boy, when I was a little girl, I knew, I knew. Folks, that's not true. When they were that young, they weren't even sexualized. They didn't know anything. And here's the great irony. On the one hand, we say, we need to stop raising our children to believe that just because a boy plays with a doll or a girl wants to play with football, that that somehow means that they're gay. And on the other hand, they go, I knew since I was little that I got, how did you know? You weren't sexual. Well, because I used to want to play with the stuff that, they, but wait a minute, how do you get to have it both ways? On the one hand, we say, this doesn't mean that. And on the other hand, we say, I know I've been this my whole life because of this meaning that. <laughs> Do you follow this? It's completely illogical. Nobody knew when they were a little kid that they were whatever sexually. They didn't even understand that sexually. They were still at that phase where, you know, they'd be walking around and if they were in the bathroom and a person of the opposite sex came around, they would go, hey, hey, how come they got that? <laughs> when you got nine kids, man, I just, you know. <laughs> you see it, you see it, man. Don't worry about it, son. You know? <laughs> Conversion, the last step in this process. Both desensitization and jamming, though extremely useful, are mere preludes to our highest, though necessarily, long-range goal, which is conversion. It isn't enough that anti-gay bigots should become confused about us or even indifferent to us. We are safest in the long run when they can actively, when we can actively make them like us. They have a whole section in their book on the love the sinner, hate the sin mentality. They despise that. They despise that. Makes them want to strangle us. That's not good enough because you're calling it sin. That's not good enough. Listen to this. Please don't confuse conversion with political subversion. By conversion, we actually mean something far more profoundly threatening to the American way of life, without which no truly sweeping social change can occur. We mean, the, we mean conversion of the average American's emotions, minds, and will through a planned psychological attack in the form of propaganda fed to the nation via the media and the schools. must get them away from a Genesis understanding of maleness and femaleness. In fact, we can't even talk about maleness and femaleness. We can't even talk about sexes. We have to talk about genders. Folks, people have sexes. Nouns have genders. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> what about black civil rights leaders? Boy, the time. Um, Julian Bond, 
former head of the NAACP. African Americans were the only Americans who were enslaved for two centuries, but we were far from the only Americans suffering discrimination then and now. Sexual disposition parallels race. In other words, gay is the new black. Coretta Scott King, widow of the late Dr. Martin Luther King, banning same-sex marriage is a form of gay bashing. Gay is the new black. It's not just on the left, it's also on the right. Michael Steele, former chair of the Republican National Committee in GQ magazine. Oh no, I don't think I've ever really subscribed to that view that you can turn it on and off like a water tap. I think that there's a whole lot that goes into the makeup of an individual that you just can't simply say, oh, like tomorrow morning, I'm going to stop being gay. It's like saying tomorrow morning, I'm going to stop being black. In other words, gay is the new black. And again, we could go on, but for the sake of time, let's move to judges and the courts. They've joined the fray. I'm not a lawyer. I don't play one on TV. <laughs> but I can read. And that's all you need to be able to do to understand the problem here. California Supreme Court. Our state now recognizes that an individual's capacity to establish a loving and long-term committed relationship with another person and responsibly to care for and raise children does not depend on the individual's sexual orientation. And more generally, that an individual's sexual orientation, like a person's race or gender, does not constitute a legitimate basis upon which to deny or withhold legal rights. We therefore conclude that in view of the substance and significance of the fundamental constitutional right to form a family relationship, I just still can't find that one. Um, the California Constitution properly must be interpreted to guarantee the, this basic civil right to all Californians, whether gay or heterosexual, and to same-sex couples as well as opposite-sex couples. There it is. It, it's, it's akin to blackness. It's the same as blackness. Um, by the way, based on what? Based on what evidence? On one of those studies that we talked about earlier? There is no proof. There is no evidence. This is made up out of whole cloth. This is a just because we say so argument from the California Supreme Court. Political leaders, President Barack Obama, while we have come a long way since the Stonewall riots in 1969, we still have a lot of work to do. Too often the issue of LGBT rights is exploited by those seeking to divide us. Okay. But at its core, this issue is about who we are as Americans. Um, yes, this is true. Here's what I want you to understand. The Stonewall riots in 1969, they are often spoken of as though they are part of this great civil rights struggle. You need to understand that the Stonewall riots in 69 were about the police who broke, down, who broke in on some bathhouses where illicit homosexual sexuality was going on, and in many instances, underage boys were being victimized by men, and the homosexual community was angry because their party was broken up. And that, our president says, is akin to marching on. Okay. All right. Um, his LGBT strategy, we'll move on. Business leaders, Steve Jobs, Sergey Brin, enough said. Religious leaders, for the sake of time. I'm telling y'all, we don't have time for all these things. I'm, I'm trying to just, all right. Religious leaders, listen to this from Brian McLaren. Talking about homosexuality. Perhaps we need a five-year moratorium on making pronouncements. In the meantime, we'll practice prayerful Christian dialogue, listening respectfully, disagreeing agreeably. When decisions need to be made, they'll be admittedly provisional. We'll keep our ears attuned to scholars in biblical studies, theology, ethics, psychology, genetics, sociology, and related fields. Then in five years, if we have clarity, we will speak. If not, we'll set another five years for ongoing reflection. After all, many important issues in church history took centuries to figure out. Not. That's not true. Maybe this moratorium would help us to resist the winds of doctrine blowing furiously from the right, from the left and the right so we can patiently wait for the wind of the Spirit to set our course. Because, you know, he's just not clear in the Bible. Gene Robinson, first gay Episcopal bishop. He was an open, open homosexual. We know that. 
Uh, but did you know that he was also an admitted alcoholic and that he had abandoned his wife and children for his gay lover? All of these things disqualified him from being a bishop. But because he was openly gay, none of that mattered. So what about their strategy? Here's where the rubber begins to meet the road. When am I supposed to stop? I got minutes here of how many minutes I'm going, but I got, okay. All right, listen, listen, okay, okay, shh, shh, shh. <laughs> their strategy. Their strategy, their strategy. I, I'm, still, I'm trying to be respectful y'all, but I'm trying to get you this information. Argument ad hominem. This is the argument against the man. This is their strategy. And this is the most common strategy when you get into a debate with people about this issue. They can't make a logical argument, so they make an argument against you. This is how kids argue. They start losing an argument and it's, well, well, well so you ugly. <laughs> that means I got nothing left, okay? <laughs> Listen to this from Representative Barney Frank. I wouldn't want the homosexual marriage issue to go to the United States Supreme Court now because that homophobe, Antonin Scalia, has too many votes on this current court. Speaking about a sitting Supreme Court justice. And do you notice that when you disagree on the issue of same-sex marriage, it is not your opinion that's wrong, it's you. You are intolerant. You are a homophobe. It's your character. You as a person, you as a human being have been judged, not your position. I want you to notice this, that the way this is discussed is always in terms of ad hominem attacks. You as a person don't deserve to be in this discussion. Question begging logic. Now begging the question, and I, I, this gets all over me. You watch the news and other places and people use beg the question when they mean raise the question. And they'll say, well, that begs the question, what about so-and-so? Actually, that's not true. To beg the question is a logical fallacy in an argument. To beg the question means to make an argument based on facts that you haven't proven. So if you and I are debating as to whether or not I beat my dog, and during the debate you say, now when you beat your dog, do you use your fist or do you, wait a minute, you haven't proven that I beat my dog, right? You're begging the question. That's what that means, all right? So this is how they argue. One way they argue is this. They say homosexuality is, an, is as immutable as ethnicity. You've heard that, right? It's immutable. It's just like ethnicity. It's just like your race. That's not true. Um, by the way, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. That's 2,000-year-old evidence that people stopped being homosexual. 2,000-year-old evidence. You can say what you want about Michael Jackson. He did not stop being black. <laughs> Secondly, homosexuals are denied a fundamental right when they are not allowed to marry. I had the privilege of testifying before the Senate in Texas when they, we were debating um, whether or not to allow um, a vote to occur to change our Constitution. And there was one black senator who was using race in a committee to stop the thing from going to a vote. And so I got a phone call um, from some folks who said, would you come up and testify before the Senate? And so I, I went up and testified before the Senate. And um, anyway, um, we, we ended up getting that done. But one of the fundamental things that people just sort of let slide is this idea Homosexuals are being denied a fundamental right. Um, it's not true. Folks, homosexuals can marry. Listen to this. This is from a newspaper article. I am married with two children. Three years ago, I found out my husband was having an affair with another man. He still lives at home and continues his relationship with this man. I don't have it in me to throw him out and get on with my life. 
I'm afraid of bringing up my children alone. Huh, sounds like there's some homosexuality and he's married. How about this one? Can you forget this headline? A married man, Thomas Beatty, who used to be a woman, says that he is pregnant and will give birth to a baby girl in July. I'll never forget that headline. Guess what? There's some homosexuality and he's married. When you go to get a marriage license, when you go to get a marriage license, nobody says, here's a test to see whether or not you're homosexual, because if you are, you can't get a marriage license. Why? Because we don't discriminate in that way. Homosexuals can't get married. By the way, the Iowa Supreme Court agrees with me. Listen to this. It is true the marriage statute does not expressly prohibit gay and lesbian persons from marrying. Boom. That ought to be it. We ought to be done right here. The statute does not discriminate. The statute does not discriminate. It does, however, require that if they marry, it must be to someone of the opposite sex. Same for me, which means there's no discrimination. Please tell me you understand this. There is no discrimination. The same law that applies to me applies to everyone else. And so when people say that there is this discrimination in the law, they are lying. The law is treating everyone equally. It's treating everyone the same. Yeah, but I don't want to do that. Okay, whatever. Listen, we won't read the rest of this statement, but just basically you understand their argument. Iowa is, the Iowa Supreme Court is basically saying because they don't want to marry somebody of the opposite sex, it's really not a right at all. So here's the reasoning. Homosexuals have the right to marry. They do not desire to exercise the right as it currently exists. Therefore, they do not have the right and the law must be changed. Right? There's the syllogism, right? How about we just change, oh, I don't know, the first line pacifists have the right to join the military. They do not desire to exercise the right as it currently exists. Therefore, they do not have the right and the law must be changed, which means we now have to establish a military that doesn't fight so that pacifists can enjoy the right like everyone else does. <laughs> Airtight irrefutable and yet we won't make the argument why because we've been des desensitized jammed and converted thirdly it's wrong to pass legislation that takes fundamental rights away from or discriminates against a group of people and in making that argument they're basically saying when two people love each other they should be allowed to get married um, all laws are discriminatory. Even this statement, when two people, when, we discriminate against 13-year-olds. Amen, somebody. Amen. Therefore, even what the homosexuals want is discriminatory. When two people, we discriminate against polygamy and polyamory. Therefore, even what the homosexuals want is discriminatory. When two people, we discriminate against bestiality and zoorasty. Therefore, even what they want is discriminatory. When two people love, a lot of people get married for some reason other than love. Now we're discriminating against them. When two people love each other, sometimes you love this person and that person, but you love that person more. <laughs> now we're discriminating against them. So even the premise of this argument refutes the idea that you can't make laws that discriminate because even the premise of this argument is discriminatory. For the sake of time, let me move forward and let me just get to the end of this. What do we do with this? A couple of things. Here's what we need to understand. We have to understand that we have truth on our side. And we also have logic on our side. <laughs> we also have to understand that the other side doesn't care about truth and doesn't care about our logic. But that must not stop us 
from making our arguments and from making our arguments scripturally. Here's the other thing that I wanted to point out. There's this genetic fallacy argument, and the genetic fallacy basically is this. You reject an argument because of where it comes from. And this is why many Christians are trying to find a way to argue against homosexual marriage that doesn't involve the Bible. Here's what that looks like to me. I am a knight, and I approach another knight, and I draw my sword, and the other knight looks at me and says, I do not believe in your sword. <laughs> and so I put my sword back, and I then give him a lecture on metallurgy to try to convince him of what would happen if I would use my sword on it. That's ridiculous. <laughs> no, I walk up. I do not believe in your sword. Fah. <laughs> do you believe now or shall I cut you some more? Here's the other problem with that. Here's what they're saying. You can't bring the Bible to bear on this argument because you cannot force your religious beliefs on other people. Huh. Let's analyze that a couple of different ways. Number one, you're saying that people who really believe their religion have no place in our society. I reject that premise. Secondly, you are saying that it is wrong for me to try to force my beliefs on you when in fact you are trying to force your beliefs on me. I reject that premise. Thirdly, you're actually arguing that I should be loving and kind and accepting toward you, which you get from my Bible, but don't acknowledge. So what you're basically saying is, you believe your Bible, therefore you don't belong in the discussion. I'm making an argument for things that are found in your Bible, but because I don't believe your Bible, I should be listened to. That dog won't hunt. We can't allow that, folks. And then finally, there's this one. There's this one, and I, I, I'll, I'll say this one, I'll be done. Here's the last issue, this issue of, yeah, well, you pick and choose. You run all over to Leviticus and these other places, and you talk about an abomination, but then, you know, you'll eat shell, shellfish, and, you know, and you'll cut the edges of your beards, and you'll sow different seeds in your fields, and certainly anybody, 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 anybody heard this? Anybody heard this? And then for most Christians, they just start going, wah, ba, ah, ba, ah, ba, ah, ba. Let me help you. First of all, when they bring this up, a couple of things to keep in mind. The first thing to keep in mind is this, that if you want to go back to Leviticus 18, one of the things that you'll find is the proper treatment of your neighbor. And one of the things that you're arguing for in our discussion is that I treat you properly as my neighbor, which is found in Leviticus 18. But you also don't believe that homosexuality is wrong, which is also found in Leviticus 18. So before I answer your question, the first thing I want to show you is that you are picking and choosing from Leviticus 18 just like I am. But the difference is I know I'm picking and choosing and I know why. There are three types of laws in the Bible. There is moral law that is forever binding on all people in all places in all times. We have this summarized for us in the Ten Commandments. There are also civil laws. These civil laws were for the nation of Israel as a nation in the ancient Near East. These laws expired with the nation of Israel, but they are still of general equity because they're based on those moral laws. Thirdly, we had the ceremonial laws. These ceremonial laws were laws that were designed to do two things. Number one, identify Israel as God's unique people, worshiping him uniquely in their context. And secondly, to point forward to the person and work of Christ. So when you talk about cutting the edge of the beard, you're actually talking about ceremonial law and Israel not being like the nations around them. When you're talking about their dietary laws, you're talking about Israel not being like the nations around them. When you talk about civil laws, you are right. We are not bound by those as they are, but they are of general equity. This is why in our own laws, we refer to things like negligent homicide which in Leviticus would say, if your ox gores someone, you're accountable for what your ox has done. You don't have an ox, but you have other things that can hurt people. So we still have that same principle, which is based on our upholding of the sixth commandment. So the reason I pick and choose from the Old Testament 
is because number one, New Testament writers do that and teach me how to do that. Number two, Christ has come and we are under the new covenant. However, he has fulfilled the whole law and he has actually enabled me to keep the moral law. The moral law hasn't gone anywhere. So it is still wrong for you to murder me or me to murder you. It is still wrong to commit adultery. It is still wrong to steal. All of these things remain. So it is because I understand how the Bible is written and I use the Bible carefully that I don't just pick and choose according to what I like, which is the exact opposite of what you are doing. So I have a better question for you. You wanted to know why I pick and choose certain parts of the Bible. I can explain it to you in painstaking detail and it gets to an authority that's higher than me. But what I want to know is this. Why is it that you get to pick and choose from the Bible? And you don't know why, and you don't know how, and whatever you choose is what you happen to want at the moment. And what's better for our society? People who decide what's right based upon what they want at the moment, or people who understand and recognize that there is a law higher than themselves, and who submit and subject themselves to that law. You answer that for me, and then we can go back to our discussion on same-sex marriage. Listen, there's much more that can be said on this. We, we, we've covered what I want to cover in this. I hope you understand a, a few things here, and I know it went very quickly. I hope you understand that this is a Genesis issue. I hope you understand that. That this is a question of origins. I hope you understand that this is an educational issue. You understand that desensitizing and jamming and conversion and that this propaganda campaign is rooted and grounded in not only the media but also in education. I hope you get this. I hope you understand this. Thirdly, I hope you understand that the arguments that are being made in favor of same-sex marriage are actually illogical unfounded arguments that can, should, and must be refuted by us as believers. And then finally, I hope you understand that ultimately what this is about is not just getting our way politically. This is ultimately about us seeing our neighbor in a house that's on fire and us loving him enough to not only say get out, but if necessary, go get him and drag him out. That's what love does. So don't let anybody tell you that it's not loving if you stand flat-footed and speak the truth about this issue of homosexuality. What's not loving is to look someone in the eye when God says they are in jeopardy of an eternity in hell and merely wink and nod at their sin because you're afraid of being called names. Speak the truth, saints. Amen.